Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Conversations Around the Table. I'm your host, Vicki Diaz. Today's conversation centers around rebranding, embracing challenges, and rebuilding yourself and your career especially in times when it wasn't necessarily your choice. Um, joining us for this conversation is Alex Bayless, as she is a mom, marketer, influencer, storyteller, and I love that you said this on your website, but a modern day Renaissance woman. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. There's a lot that I want to discuss um, with you <laughs> from like a professional standpoint, of course, um, you know, marketing, growing your personal brand, reinvention. But I think to know you professionally is to also know you personally. Um, so I wanted to kind of start by saying how I am familiar with you. Okay. And it was, I definitely want you to have the opportunity to introduce yourself, but I was introduced to you by a friend, a photographer friend who, um, back in 2020, I was going through my own personal divorce. And I think, you know, at that stage in life, you're just lost. You feel confused. You feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And so she had just sent me your Instagram page and she goes, listen, I follow her. I think she'd be really good for you just to kind of get some insight. And so she sent it to me. And I remember, um, actually I read my first DM to you cause you did respond. It was very nice. Um, and I remember reading it yesterday and it just reminded me, I, hadn't really like, you know, I kind of hit the follow button. I was like, okay, like if it pops up, it pops up. And then one day there was something that just, I felt called to like, look at your page. And I did. And it just happened to be like a time, a place, a post that really was like capturing, you know, your growth from like where you once were to where you are then. And I remember I sent you a message and I just was like, listen, you probably won't answer this, this, you know, direct message, you know, cause you look at your, I, someone's following and you just go, okay, I'm one in like, you know, 50,000 or something. <laughs> and I just remember reaching out to you just saying like, this was my experience. I'm looking at you and I'm just seeing like, it is possible to move on. And you responded and we had like definitely a dialogue for, you know, for little things. And I just want to say like, I really appreciate it. it was very inspiring. And, um, it definitely was, I would say you were a big piece of like my own growth. Cause I got to see that future, that possibilities, those opportunities in someone else, even though we might not have had the exact same. You made me cry. <laughs> I'm like, I love this. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, sorry that way, but I just definitely wanted to share that as, as, um, you know, like I said, at that time, you don't think that there are going to be future chapters or like good as the ones before. And especially as a new mother, from my perspective at the time, my daughter wasn't even one yet. And, you know, post life of divorce, devastation, motherhood and, and so forth. Like it was it was really great to see that your trials aren't they they definitely are a part of your journey, but they don't make you who you are. Um, so yeah, I just want to say that that was like my introduction to you. And I've since then for the last, you know, four years have definitely been following your, your journey and your growth to where you are now. So, <laughs> and uh, now I turn it to you, like tell everyone about, about yourself. But I, I wanted to say that because, um, that's, that was important to me, but for those who are unfamiliar with your story, um, I guess to share, especially because like so much of what you're sharing now is the sense of reinvention. Um, can you share how your own sort of reinvention started? Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I, I am a bit emotional <laughs> for those that are listening that are not watching. Um, thank you for, I just need to say thank you for saying that. I don't think you know, on the, I'm sure we'll get into social media and, and influencing and all that, but you don't actually get to often meet the people that you influence in a positive way. And my intention of sharing was obviously to, well, I don't know if this is for everyone, but for me, it was with purpose of like, maybe this is going to help somebody. Cause I feel really alone. So it's really great to meet you and to know that, you know, when, when you hear things like that, it, it reminds you like you're, pain has purpose and it's not wasted, you know? And, and I, I think we can choose to let it be wasted if we want to, but we can use to, um, give it, give it purpose. And that's, that's what I was hopeful to do 
And I do now remember, like I, I have these exchanges with different women at different times, you know, but now I'm remembering like even just your handle, I can see it now. And, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. So for me, um, well, hi everyone (laughs) listening. Um, my, I don't think that my story is very unique. And like you said, it's, there's a shared experience in the loss of uh, a marriage. There's, there's so many people over 50% of marriages and divorce. Um, but yet it just wasn't really talked about a lot at the time that I began sharing on Instagram, which was 2017. Um, this is before the movement of vulnerability mm-hmm. and all that kind of came to the forefront. And then now is like a tactic for marketing, which I have mixed feelings about, but, but at the time it was more like, I just can't write about another chair or an outfit. I can't pretend that life is good and perfect. And I don't know how to, I, I just need to be me. And that was the first step towards healing. But my life before all of what my life is today was a suburban, wife to in Chandler, Arizona in a single detached home that was stucco and beige and ran to Costco and Target and everyone around is wearing leggings and tennis shoes and hats and you know the the kind of basic life (laughs) and that's what my life was and it was wasn't bad I loved it at the time I thought things were okay I was in the throes of motherhood and more like focused on how do you be a mom and as a new mom I had a right before everything happened I had a four-year-old and a one and a half year old and I was just navigating how to have two kids and with a son who was kind of in and out of being really sick he dealt with like severe allergies and um I just moved away from my community for my marriage actually we were struggling in our marriage and we kind of moved to start over and And so I was kind of struggling with things secretly, but hopeful and going to therapy and starting some of that, that process. And I had a side hustle. I had an an influencer business and a content creation business, and I had a million followers plus, and I was doing big campaigns with like Home Depot and Target and seemingly dream life to a lot of people. I don't think I bought shampoo for like five years, you know. A, what a lot of people look at as an ideal life to get free product and to work from home and to also get to be a mom. And I was living that, but I was really unhappy and my body was also becoming very sick. Um, I would later, just a couple months after my ex-husband left, um, find out that I have three autoimmune diseases and right in the beginning of facing single motherhood, sickness, Um, I needed health insurance and the private market was too expensive for me to afford. So I had to give all that up and I had to start over and go work at a influencer marketing agency was the easiest transferable positioning for myself. And I sat next to my intern that I had hired as the same, at the same level, making the same money with my intern and with a bunch of recent college graduates, I was 33 and they were all 23 and my boss was younger than me and the owner of an influencer marketing agency that, and he was the expert, even though I had helped pioneer the industry. So that's my life and it crumbled and I was all alone. I don't have family here or now I do, but I didn't then. And and I had to start over. Yeah. And now I'm not any of those things. (laughs) 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 <laughs> like thankfully yeah that's always like the 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 definitely the the great thing especially like I don't necessarily put myself in that same maybe position as as you um where I still am becoming more comfortable talking about that stuff on social mm-hmm. um but I appreciate when people do and so when I do encounter people in real life who are experiencing those things I try to give as much of the hard love because you also want them to think clearly sometimes mm-hmm. we let our emotions do a lot of like the, the thinking and leading mm-hmm. um but i also try to share with them like the same kind of insights that i felt that i got from you um 
and, you know, many other women in my, in my life, you know, th- like I said, th- there are so many things that, that connect you like that invisible string with so many people unbeknownst to you. Um, but at the same time, everyone has like their own levels and journey with it. Um, so I definitely like to share that as well. And I'm really surprised to hear that, that you don't get to meet some of these women in person as, as much. I honestly, I, maybe I felt I had this vision of it that I was like, (laughs) she's just constantly being flocked by like admirers of like, thank you. No, I don't. I, I, you know, I think in the beginning I received a lot of messages, but like, I'm sure many listeners can experience even in times of their own pain, whatever that might be. People are usually there in the very beginning, but very few people stay through the journey. Mm. And that's actually when you need your community most. I've, felt very alone. Um, and it's not because people don't care. It's that either people don't know how to help or it, and also there's a responsibility on my part to ask for help. Um, and then there aren't very many people that know what to say or do unless you've been through it. And that's the thing that I realize is there's, it's the divorce club is the club is the best club you never wanted to be in, you know? Yeah. Like I never wanted to join this club, but it's also the coolest club of a bunch of single moms that are really strong. And I've never known how strong I was until now. And it's the best, worst thing that has ever happened. I think, um, Mary Oliver ha- says it better, but she says something like, um, I received is like the best gift I never wanted to open kind of a thought of, um, you know, I think, there's a lot, pain is our best teacher and it is the catalyst for transformation and reinvention. So if someone's listening to this right now and they want to change their life and they're unhappy with their life, maybe start with some gratitude of the pain that you're experiencing as best you can, not to like, you know, gloss over it, but as in like, this is the moment that is going to you're going to look back and you're going to be glad that you had this moment mm-hmm. so you can start changing your life. I like what you say about community because it's definitely is, is probably the biggest thing in, in my experience. Um, not only as, as personally as a single mother, but also as a professional, I think it, it helped. It opened me up a little bit more. Um, now I feel more connected to, um, especially when you go through a, a dynamic where another person is involved in like the, the breakdown of, of a relationship, you can kind of harbor these like negativity, um, emotions, but luckily what came out of that for me was a community. And I, I would love to hear from you. Like, what have you learned from, you know, the other women that you've, um, connected with or who are in your community who may be navigating similar life transitions or similar reinventions, um, and that could be within divorce or pursuing new careers. Um, I would say, you know, when when people would come along and say, one day you're going to look back on it and it's going to be the best, like the people that are too far out from it. Sometimes I just didn't even know how to comprehend what they were saying. And so it wasn't that helpful. You know, it gave me a little bit of hope, like maybe I'll be like her one day. But I just wanted to know it wasn't even about being happy or having a dream life at that Mm -hmm. point, when you're in the middle of a pit, you're just wanting to know, am I going to be okay? Okay. Is the the next goal, right? So I think the best advice that I have received, and I think this is really true in business as well is when we have analysis paralysis, where we're feeling so overwhelmed that we almost can't move and we're paralyzed, just focus on the next right thing, just the next right thing. And sometimes it's a minute to minute thing. And sometimes it's a day to day thing, but especially when you are sick and you're taking care of kids still, and you're having to figure out your life and you're really in the the thick of it, just the next right thing. And eventually you will get there. Um, I think that uh, another thing that women have taught me is, you know, no one's going to value your time. Like you value your time. Nobody is. Not even your kids. Okay. Especially not your kids. They don't care. (laughs) They don't care. Um, So, you know, I needed to, a lot of women struggle with identifying what they need. I think a lot of women know what they want 
And then they have a lot of resentment towards anything that gets in the way of what they want. But a lot of the needs and wants are different and you have to meet your needs in order to get what you want. So you got to start there. What are your actual needs? How much money do you need to make per month for you to feel okay to pay your bills? How much, what do you need more sleep? Okay. So go to sleep, go to sleep. When your kid goes to sleep, stop watching TV. You know, my life looks very, very boundaried now because I realize I have, these are my needs and that's what they are. I'm not going to shame them. And I need eight to nine hours of sleep in order to be a normal person. And, uh, you know, I also need to work and I, you know, I don't have a lot of personal time. It's the reality of it. And as much as I wanted to date, I realize I can't do that. That's not a need. That's yeah. a want. A partnership is a want. It was not a need. I needed to figure out my body. I needed to heal that. I needed to figure out my career. I needed to fix things in my life before I could even think about somebody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, the, and women tend to like think about partnership. I'm like, well, no, 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 no. no. Yeah. No. I, I think I hear that a lot too from other um, women or men. Um, That's true. I guess yeah, it's not a gender who, thing. Yeah, but who who have are going through something similar of that transition, you know, and in this case, you know, post-divorce and they can have a really good grasp, let's say on their career or on mm -hmm. their kids. But then when it comes to like themselves, that's where things yep. can kind of get a little bit diluted. Um, and they right away just go in order for me to feel valuable, validated, um, purposeful, et cetera. It's then to put myself back into like Relationship. relationships within, you know, I've been on both sides of it. I'm just like, no, I, and then I, I think I've also learned the, the last it, uh, for me, six years has been that my own company has been something that I avoided for a long time. I always kept myself busy. I always kept myself with other people. If it was not with men or relationship, it was with friends or it was at work. And so there was very little time for me to just even sit with myself. So when I was forced to, I mean, really had no choice other than to do that. That's when I got to learn about myself or just sort of get to re energize and to for, for that phrase that we're working with today is to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And I even tell people, I go, if you knew, uh, Vicky circa, you know, X, Y, and Z, I was like, I mean, there are a lot of elements of myself that are very much have followed me within this reinvention of myself, mm -hmm. but there's so much that I think are, is so different. I feel a little bit softer, I'm not as um, aggressive as I think I once was and not to a fault, but I feel like I just approach things differently. Obviously motherhood has definitely changed me and, and really was a saving grace for me, um, as well. Uh, but there are so many things that, yeah, that you have to really take the time to think about when you are, whether it's consciously or unconsciously thinking about that reinvention of yourself. I think a lot of reinvention for many, and and I don't work with men in particular, so I keep saying when women, but I don't think it's gender specific, but I tend to see a lot of the reinvention happen just purely in the fundamentals of meeting your needs. Mm -hmm. If you were to meet me in 2017 or prior to that, I was someone that was people pleasing, a perfectionist, and I was overextending myself and codependent, trying to... And, and these were all adaptations I would later learn through therapy that I, this is how I knew how to navigate the world, right? And there there can be pluses to that in like a business world to being a people pleaser and being rewarded for that, right? Especially in influencer marketing and social media. But that's how I knew. So I'd worn myself so thin. So the biggest reinvention was actually stopping a lot of those toxic behaviors and finding worth in like my self-worth and saying I'm worthy of this time for myself and really facing the shame and the guilt that I had for prioritizing myself, letting go of people being angry at me and knowing that that's not outside of my control. There are so many behaviors that I think we need to be cognizant of that keep us from being the woman or person that we want to be. And 
when we imagine these dream lives for ourselves and we get to that state where we can actually finally imagine and dream again, which that is a privilege, Mm -hmm. by the way, that people don't understand. And I also say this as a privileged person from the beginning of like that, there was still a lot of privilege in that moment of my life falling apart. I had a college degree. I had a lot, like I wasn't maybe at a, at the same circumstance as someone that didn't have any education. There's, there's so many different starting points, but we, we hopefully will get to a place where we can experience what it's like to dream without any restrictions and to let ourselves do that and to let ourselves hold hope, which hope is very heavy to carry. I don't think people talk about how heavy hope is. It is not light. It is a heavy burden when you cannot see how you can get there, when there is not a path forward to that hope that people will speak over you or that you want you want to hold. It is very heavy. You need other people to hold it for you for a while. You think about this, you think like you want these dreams, but are you even ready to handle them if they came to you today? Mm-hmm. This is all preparation for, for me or for, for the listener that's listening some of this waiting, there's purpose in it to prepare you for being able to hold that dream and, and not hold it for a second, but hold it for the rest of your life. And you need those fundamentals and you need your health and your body and your mind and your relationships in a sturdy place in order to be able to hold that dream and bring it to fruition. I love that. Yeah. I, I feel like now I've definitely thankfully have like moved from like this, um, fear or anxious state that so much of like a uh, transition yes. can, can <laughs> you just kind of sit with it. But to your point, though, I now feel like I am more hopeful and um, definitely focus more on imagining and thinking of the future. There still is the, yeah, that, that heaviness that comes with that because when you do that, there is like a level of preparing yourself for, okay, if it doesn't go your way or if it doesn't pan out the way I'm such a planner. So it took, <laughs> it took a lot for me to be like, if things go astray a little bit, yeah. it's not the end of the world. How do I pivot? How do I take this off road experience mm-hmm. and shape it into the, the best way I can? And I saying that and segue into sort of like now you're, movement from like being a stay-at-home mom and going back into the corporate world. What, I guess, what was that mindset and those challenges that you encountered when making that shift, when taking this off-road experience, knowing that, yes, you now you have to make money to support your kids, um, being their sole provider and, and, and so forth at that time. But what was that experience like for you? How did you make the most of those challenges going in? Oh, it was really hard. <laughs> I, I think it exposed a lot of stuff in me that I needed to work on. Um, it was very humbling to, you know, come out to my community of perfect squares and a perfect life and say how imperfect, imperfect my life was very scary. I lost brand partnerships in the process and I lost money. I mean, People don't want to pay you to have an unhappy life. They want to pay you to have a happy one. And that's just the reality of it. I'm on the brand side now. And yeah, I have to be mindful of how my product is positioned out in the world and I'm paying for that. So, you know, it's, it's not easy. So I had a loss there. I lost followers when I started talking about the real parts of my life. They only wanted to be there for the pretty house photos and had to be, willing to let go of that. Um, I then going into a workplace where I had worked for myself for the past five years and built a business and half of it was gone because in the divorce proceedings, it goes, you know, that goes due. Um, to work for someone else was really hard. I felt like I'd failed you know, I'd failed, I'd, I'd worked super hard for this life and I'd failed and it, I felt like it had been taken from me because I didn't want the, a divorce. I didn't anticipate it. And to accept something, the loss of something, it felt stolen. I felt like motherhood was stolen from me because 
I had worked hard to have my own business also so that I could be home more because I grew up with a parents. I was a latchkey kid. I didn't have parents around and they were, they were working. They needed to work, you know, and that's just what our circumstances were. But regardless, like I, I didn't grow up with parents around. So I really wanted that experience for my kids and I had to put them in full time daycare my son was like barely of age they took him early just for me and um I missed out on a lot of I felt like I missed out on a lot of life and then I was working for a company doing influencer marketing hiring my friends all of a sudden the emails that I would get to do these campaigns I would say hey you know I remember like Lola she's a local influencer You're like hey lola would you be interested in like doing this campaign for fox restaurant concepts it's co- cost this much can you send me your rates in some ways i'm like oh i got to see everyone's rates and how they handle things like this is kind of <laughs> cool but you know for the most part it was really i felt humiliated and uh and i also recognize like how much privilege i had to be a stay-at-home parent that is a privilege that i did not that i took for granted and i also felt stupid. I felt stupid for letting my spouse control so much of the money and so much of the power I'd given my power away. And I didn't even realize how much power I had given. It was really, really hard. There were so many areas at once that were broken in me and to transition into a professional world after building your business, when everything in the millennial zennial culture is all about entrepreneurship to go work for the big man, as they say, is a failure versus everyone congratulates you when you finally leave your corporate job to go do your own thing. I was the first person to go back and no one else had talked about how hard that was or no one else had talked about how to do, how, how do you market yourself to a company when you've worked for yourself for years and most companies are scared of you. They think, oh, you're just going to work here until you can go back to your business or you're just, you're not really trustworthy because we don't know if you can work well with others you're used to being the boss. So we don't know if you're a good employee. Um, there are a lot of narratives that you have to address. And, uh, unfortunately they made me start from the bottom just, you know, and now I help women change the narrative so that they can effectively market themselves as an, as an employee, as an entrepreneur, which is a wonderful word. And I can't tell you how many women now are coming to me that have owned their businesses and saying, yeah, I'm tired of wearing 10 hats. I kind of want to do one job and I want a paycheck and I want 401ks and I want all these benefits and health insurance. And then I'll just keep a side hustle instead. There are so many people coming back to the workforce. And truly, if we want to make an impact, and I believe this is more of a business thing, but I've realized now that working for someone in an organization, especially a purpose-driven organization, I have more ability to affect change in the world, working on a team with people who are like-minded for this vision, with a well-funded organization that has money and power to affect change. So if you really want to affect change, rather than each person out there doing it on their own, it's group, it's coming together for a purpose to drive change. You know, we're doing it in the area of sustainability. I work for a sustainable diaper company for those listening. But I think the other thing that I've learned is when you're not profiting off of social media or your art form or your passion, which so many people want to do their passion for full time, when you're not profiting fully off that, it takes the pressure off for you to be truly creative. Creative Creativity needs time and space. And when you're needing to get that dollar you are so tempted to sacrifice some of your values or your creativity for the dollar. So now I post when I want to post. I don't care if I lose a follower. I post what I want to say. It's not driven by sponsorship. I don't worry about needing to go market after the next thing. I'm just who I am. I don't need a edited photos. I don't need a photographer following me around. I don't need to do any of that. And you know what? haven't lost very many people it's actually worked out really well (laughs) and there's a lot of freedom in it and I have great paycheck I'm (laughs) loving everything that you're saying there and there's so much to like dive into I love um I mean one that that's it's so interesting to hear that you know 
pre this, like you said, this authentic, like marketing approach, um, when you were doing that, just how much that affected Mm -hmm. not only your creativity, your livelihood, your relationships, your connections. I mean, it it took a toll more than, than just like, you know, more of a, a mental, emotional space. Yeah. There was a lot that came with that. And that's, and now, of course, now that we're in this, like, authenticity marketing <laughs> now you're just like what so you were ahead of your game <laughs> yeah that's not what kind of how it always has been I'm more of a pioneer person anyway yeah. um how did so would you say it was your experience um managing your own you know social account presence that um and, and having that experience with influencer marketing that got you into brand marketing like how did you make that segue and now you know, that's really like where your, your lane is for your professional career. Yeah. I definitely didn't anticipate going into brand marketing for the brand side. I had always seen myself more as, um, an agent and in the agency world, you know, being a creator, you are a micro agency. You are, you are a mini walking content agency. And I, well, and even before that, I had a styling business. So I had started art directing and styling and working on production. And I knew a lot of photographers and videographers and, you know, people in that world. And so, and I knew what it took to pu- to pitch things to publications to get my work published. Mm-hmm. I knew a little bit of that as a business owner, as a stylist. Then when my following came on somewhat of a happy accident, um, that put me, th- there was no way to monetize social media at the time I got a million followers. It was 2010 and it just was one day I just saw the ticker just going up and up and up. And I, I remember the moment of like, huh, like, what do you, this is cool, I guess, but what do you do with this? Like no one really knew the power. I mean, it was weird. It was wild. Like you pin something to Nordstrom and it just sell out immediately. And like, huh affiliate marketing hadn't really started yet. So there's no way to make a commission quickly. These things started happening together. Mm -hmm. And by 2011, a year later, I can make commission on anything I pinned and then glamor. But right as that happened, like glamor came knocking on my door and Revlon came knocking on my door. And I had never negotiated deals with the brands that as a stylist, I dreamed of talking to. So I was just doing things for free but then my name was in Glamour magazine. So that was pretty cool. So I was just figuring things out as I went, but I think I have a knack for business and just quickly like small things that make a big impact. In fact, you're excellent at this, by the way, responding quickly to emails. I knew that with PR, you always have to respond right away. Don't wait, make sure that you're doing the work for ahead of the person don't make the worst person work for you just being a reliable employee that's quick at responding and clear and communicative is huge in any type of partnership so I would take a little bit of here and there and previous skills I had and start growing and that's those are the same skills I still apply as a SVP of brand marketing now Mm -hmm. but then you know you start working with big fortune 100 companies like Home Depot and you learn how to read contracts. You learn how to, um, you understand like there's a big budget and then the many people that have to approve it. I got to see a lot of things on the creator side. So then when I had to pivot into agency world as an influencer marketing agency, I had this credibility as an influencer to speak to Ralph's grocery or to fe- speak to Fox restaurant concepts about this is the the strategy and the plan. I was thinking as an influencer, but just as an agency. Mm-hmm. And so it was pretty easy there. And then when I was approached to be the creative director for a content studio, the whole job was about video and photo production at scale with creators across the United States for the the camping and RV world. That was super easy for me because I was already doing content at scale as a creator. I just now was speaking the language of all these other creators and building a database and doing it with campaigns that I, the campaign language and the, the key performance indicators and the marketing jargon that I learned at the agency. So it's kind of like building blocks so that when I finally entered the brand world and a recruiter reached out to me for this position, 
I had already known how to report the success of a campaign. I knew what content was performing and what wasn't from the agency side. I knew how to put a report together. I knew how to budget because I'd run my own business. And that's all brand marketing. And at the end of the day, brand marketing is just on the brand side. You're just owning the actual brand and being the steward of the brand and holding the branding standards and saying, this is what I want it to look like. This is what it should look like. This is how we should say it. And then this is how I want to get it out in order to meet this awareness objective. And so all those building blocks came in all those other hats. We don't have too many CMOs that have been creators first yet, No, but I, I look forward to being the first. <laughs> I, well, with that said, I would love to hear, I know we talked, you briefly talked about it at the beginning, but to expand on it, now being in sort of having those those two sort of lanes that you you drive in, how have you noticed influencer marketing has changed? Um, you know, are there specific elements of it that still feel tried and true to you? And there are certain things that just now feel a little gimmicky. I'm curious to know now that you are, are in sort of both of those positions. It's hard for me sometimes because I think I have the burnout. Once I put my influencer hung that hat up, <laughs> literally hung the influencer hat up on the wall. Uh, I realized how much burnout that I had and from constantly having my phone on and a camera out, I had to really slow down my thinking and I was just in the rhythm of just per- being performative for who I kept asking myself, what am I, who am I doing this for? And so sometimes now when I look at influencers in that space, I respect it as a business and I know how hard it is. It's very hard. And at the same time, my heart wants to ask like, why are you doing this? Like, do you really want to do this? Do you really, really want to put your whole life out there? And what are, are you doing it so you can affect positive change in people's lives? Or are you doing it as an income stream? And I don't want to shame income streams because income is income, whatever you're doing. Like, I'm not going to shame anybody for it. But I'd also ask the question, is there another way you can satiate the need without having to put your whole life on display if you don't want to do that? If you want to do that, great. But if you don't want to do that, there are other ways. And I think sometimes the, what it's doing to my own friends and their lives, like I know firsthand what that's like. I know that my ex-husband and I, to be fair to him, like that to be an Instagram husband was not what he signed up for and he didn't really like it. And he's a very private person that that's not, it's not for everybody and it's not for everybody's partner or everybody's kid or my kids always having a camera in their face and they hated it. They still hate it. You know, so I didn't realize like my job was affecting a lot of people. I also didn't realize like what it was doing to, you know, me when I experienced hardship because hardship is going to come for everybody. We're all going to die or we're going to know someone that dies or loss is inevitable. It's a promise in this lifetime. It's not a what if it's a, it's a promise. We will lose things and we will even lose our own lives eventually. And we have to think through that process. And as a woman too, your, your looks and your beauty, and that's still a pressure. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even recognize that I was like, monetizing my body and it's okay if again like no shame if people choose to do it consciously and they want to do that but I don't think I was conscious about everything that I was doing because it just kind of happened and I just went with it without thinking I kind of was in that realm too from a very different perspective um when I lived uh my my 20s um was I fell into this pressure of creating content that it was all about how many likes I could get or wanting people to, in some way, in a very odd way, like not be envious of my life, but be envious of the experiences that I was having. You know, I, I was very into hiking, backpacking, nature. And so I took pride in like going 
up these these mountains um, in Seattle and um, taking these photos and people just awing over like it's so beautiful. My gosh, I wish I should get into hiking and really like creating this sort of experience. And I ended up kind of having a little bit of that Instagram husband uh, notion for someone who also is very private. And uh, even though that's like a very small fraction of what, you know, is necessarily a ripple effect of many things, it post, you know, this reinvention of myself, it's something that I like pulled back on. I think that's kind of where I'm at now of finally getting to that point of being more open Um, because now my page is still on private and I'm still slowly emerging from this sort of shell shock experience that kind of like had me like rebuttal a little bit. And now I'm beginning to like flourish, but in my own way. I don't care if you like it or not. I don't care if it's the best photo, especially if my kid is making a face and I'm like, and I'm not going to get it. And they're not here for your kids. No. You're like, I don't care. I, I didn't create this account for you. I no. created it for me. I, I mean, honestly, and I love that you said that you've reinvented yourself numerous times. Because I think that's also definitely the a, a notion to set is we might have pinpointed a very specific time as like our main reinvention. But we've, yeah. I mean, we see that in ourselves all the time. Like I keep journals from like sixth grade now and I'm able to see, <laughs> thankfully able to see that reinvention happening um, or those changes in myself. It just happens to be for a lot of people, there is one major catalyst that really does set the tone where you're more maybe consciously aware of these reinventions of yourself or um, just really helps you set the stage for others or, or is just a great you know point to always come back to. What would be at least one piece of advice, one just thing you want the listener to take away um, from this conversation as they think about reinventing themselves personally or professionally? What would that be? It's never too late. And you truly do have the power to choose differently for yourself. I can't tell you how long it will take. I can tell you it's, it could take a really long time. But if you're not attached to the when, you're not attached to the how, but you know the what and the why, you will do it. It is possible. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. And with that note, you can learn more about or connect with Alex by visiting her website, alexfelas.com. We'll put the link in the description. And until next time, bye guys.